Our scripture passage this morning is Psalms 45. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your errors are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall upon you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Orphea. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes she is led to the king, with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. In the place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. Well, maybe some of you watched the uh, coronation of King Charles last month, if you got up early in the morning. If you did, you heard a famous British anthem written by Handel that's been sung at the coronation of every British monarch, uh, monarch since 1727. It's called Zadok the Priest. The lyrics are few, but powerful. Here they are. Zadok the Priest and Nathan the Prophet anointed Solomon king. And all the people rejoiced, rejoiced, rejoiced. And from then on, it's just a repetition of God save the king, long live the king, may the king live forever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. It's a really stirring song. Uh, the lyrics are drawn right from uh, 1 Kings chapter 1 and the crowning of Solomon. Zadok and Nathan, they put Solomon on King David's mule and they bring him to Gihon. Verse 39, there Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. What a description. So, so this song, Handel, he is, he's pulling from this rich biblical imagery. And I'm just, I just got to say, you got to go home. You got to pull it up on Spotify. You got to turn it up loud. Moms in the minivans, just crank it up. <laughs> Roll down the windows. Make your kids love it. It is, it is a great song. Why is this song so moving? And why would people be drawn to watch the coronation of a king in a country not their own? Well, nothing's sacred anymore. Everything's mocked and deconstructed. It seems anything beautiful and solemn is questioned and ridiculed. Nevertheless, people still long for the sacred, something weighty and glorious and noble that there's a hunger for it, maybe because that's what we were made for. It's a universal human experience. We long for a good king to come and reign and set wrongs to right. And then deeper still, to actually be in union with this king, to be represented by him, 
to be known by him, to be received into his fellowship, his, his very presence. That would be worth writing a song about. Well, that's what the sons of Korah have done for the people of Israel and for all of God's people here in God's word. There is an answer to that longing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So if you've been with us the past several Sundays, you know that we've been going through a portion of the book of Psalms by these sons of Korah. Mark and Philip have both pointed out that there is a discernible order to these Psalms, a steadily growing hope. It's intensely personal. The psalmist spells out to God all that he's going through. He pours out his soul. In Psalm 42, the psalmist is in the depths of despair. Just listen to some of the phrases. My tears have been my food all day and night. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? And in 43, he pleads that God would come and deliver him from evil people. He says, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? And then in 44, he wrestles with God over the bitter providences of his life. I think the imagery that Mark used last Sunday is so helpful here. Earlier, the psalmist was so depressed, it's like he couldn't get out of bed. And in 44, it's like he's pacing the house. He's crying out to God, even arguing with him. Why are you sleeping? Oh, Lord, rouse yourself. Rise up, come to our help. And then the final cry of Psalm 44, redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Well, enter Psalm 45. The scene and the tone has changed drastically. The psalmist is now rejoicing. He's celebrating a certain king from David's line who was marrying a princess. And we're caught up in all the scents and the sounds and the scenery of the occasion. It's a royal wedding. It's glorious and it's bursting with joy. The language, it's actually reminiscent of the Song of Solomon. If you look there at the superscript, that's what we call it, those words in all caps right there at the top, it's called a love song. Well, how does it break down? Well, first, the king himself is described in verses 2 through 8, and then his bride in verses 9 through 16. But clearly, it's this anointed king who stands at the center of this psalm. The main theme is revealed by the first verse and the last verse. The psalmist says in verse 1, I address my verses to the king. And then in verse 17, I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. So, so that's what the psalmist is doing here. He's bracketed the psalm with his main point. He's reveling in this king, and he's summoning his readers to do the same down through the ages. So still just introducing the psalm, let's look at the enthusiasm this psalmist has for this king, he says, my tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. What does that mean? Well, ready scribe, he knows the Bible well. He swims in the Bible. He's very familiar with the promises of God's word. He knows exactly where to go. He says, my heart overflows with a pleasing theme. So that the Hebrew there could be translated good word. My heart overflows with a good word. It seems he's, he's pondering the promises of God in the word of God, he's stewing on them. And because of the next phrase, I address my verses to the king. It seems he's reflecting on the promises of God related to the promised king in David's line. And the rest of the psalm is going to bear this out. Again, it's called a love song. And it describes an actual royal wedding in Israel, but at the same time, the praises for this king are so lavish, it's hard to imagine this applying to any king in Israel, David included. It outstrips its immediate context and speaks of things more glorious to come. It's actually brimming with prophecy for the long awaited Messiah. Great David's greater son, David's son, yet David's Lord. Well, what did God promise 
David. It's all laid out in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God said, I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. He said, I will give you rest from all your enemies. He said, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He said, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Every one of these promises to David gets pulled forward and applied to the king of this psalm. You remember Jesus' words when he appeared to his disciples at the end of Luke. He says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the psalms must be fulfilled. Psalm 45 is about King Jesus and us, his bride, the church, being united to him. That's what's going on. So out of our perplexing trials that many times we can find no apparent purpose for, no sign of the goodness of God, and for a time, no answer from heaven, like the door of heaven has been bolted shut against us, this hope of a coming king is a great comfort. I pray it is for you this morning. So, so I'd like to tell you about this king this morning. In fact, the overarching point of application for this sermon is very simple. Revel in him. Glory in him. Rejoice over him. We're going to look at his majesty, his word, his conquest and rule, his deity, and finally, his bride. And I promise this will not be a three-hour sermon. Majesty, majesty, it's another word for greatness. Uh, the king here is visually majestic. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Other translations say, thou art fairer than the sons of men. You are the most excellent of men. The psalmist's hope in this future king is so strong that, that he sees him as beautiful. Isaiah writes that the people of God will behold the king in his beauty. Still, that line, you were the most handsome of the sons of men, might be kind of hard to get our minds around. Well, the Hebrew word for man is Adam. Uh, so you could read it, you were the most handsome of the sons of Adam. And this recalls the fall of Adam and the promise of Genesis 3.15 that one day a son of the woman would come to crush the head of the serpent and overturn the curse. So this king is a son of Adam and yet he is most excellent, most handsome. Remember, David was described as handsome. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, th these allusions are intentional. This king is a son of Adam in the Davidic line who rides out in great majesty and power to conquer his enemies. He is visually magnificent. But think, think with me for a moment. If someone said, if we had a picture of Jesus and his disciples, we wouldn't be able to pick out which one was him because there was nothing remarkable about his physical appearance. He did not enter Jerusalem on a horse, but a donkey. He did not bear a sword nor a scepter. He had no palace. In fact, he said, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He never owned a royal robe. In fact, his clothes were stripped from him and divided up over a game of cards. Isaiah writes, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah actually writes that his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. One commentator said, Jesus was beaten into a shockingly inhuman mass of wounded flesh. This is how our majestic king would conquer, by being crushed himself. You can see why the disciples didn't initially understand a crucified Messiah? Never. 
Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Friends, this, this is how the cry for vindication and redemption from Psalm 43 and 44 would be answered. The promised deliverer, the majestic king himself, would empty himself and take the form of a servant and enter our world of sin and suffering and lay down his life for you, his bride. And now, resurrected from the dead, he is blindingly beautiful. With the glory he had with the Father before the world existed. You remember the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus unveils that glory just for a few moments? Matthew records that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. We find a similar description in John's vision of Christ in Revelation. He writes, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like the flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. That glory blinded the Apostle Paul at his conversion. You could say it changed his life. Friends, do you want your life to change? Become well acquainted with the glory of Jesus Christ. Revel in this king. This is how we are transformed, by beholding the glory of the Lord in all its facets. The longer we stare, the more beautiful and precious we will come to realize he truly is. And we ourselves, in union with him, will share in his glory. As he is beautiful, he makes us become beautiful. But this king speaks to us As well, let's look at his word. Verse 2, grace is poured upon your lips, therefore God has blessed you forever. Again, the psalmist, he is drawing out another connection to David. David said in 2 Samuel 23, the spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. So this king, he is in the Davidic line, but he's he's also a prophet. He's a king and a prophet who speaks for God. If you remember the common people of Jesus' day, they enjoyed listening to him. Mark records that Jesus once asked the crowd, interestingly enough, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? And he quotes Psalm 110 and says, David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? Well, Mark then writes, and the great throng heard him gladly. They loved to listen to Jesus. Then in John, there's the story when officers tried to arrest Jesus, uh, but they come back to the Pharisees empty-handed, and the Pharisees say, why didn't you bring him? And they say, no one spoke like this man. Uh, They didn't know what to do. His words just undid them. They, they, They didn't know what to do. Remember again the Mount of Transfiguration when when Peter, he's prattling on, right? And the voice from heaven actually interrupts him, saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. We dare not ignore the king when he speaks. Doesn't this make you want to read your Bible more? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This king is a prophet king, blessed of God forever, which is precisely what God vowed to David regarding his offspring. The king of Psalm 45 is none other than the promised Messiah in David's line. He is a prophet, but he's also a warrior. So let's look now at his conquest and rule. Verse 3, gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. 
Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. So this king is a warrior king bearing weapons, charging into battle. And the psalmist cheers him on. Arm yourself. Ride out. Let your right hand teach you fearsome deeds. It sounds like King Theoden from uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings. Fell deeds awake. Probably would not say that at a wedding today, but you would at this one. You would at this one. The psalmist longs for this king to come and conquer and put down all who stand against him because this would be right. This would be right. Look at verse 6 six and 7. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. This is a good king. He's morally upright. He opposes all evil. And why does he fight? Verse 4, for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Just look at that word meekness. That should jump off the page. Uh, this king is no doubt a mighty military figure, but he, he's not brandishing his power. He's not flaunting his strength. No, he's actually humble. In the ancient Near East, you'd never praise your king for being meek, but Israel does. All the other nations saw humility as a sign of weakness in their rulers, but not Israel. No, no, their promised king would be righteous. He would uphold God's law. He would be obedient to the truth. He would be humble. And this humble king will triumph over all his enemies. You remember, this king is a son of Adam. Satan was told right from the beginning that a certain son would be his undoing. God says, he shall bruise your head. When you think of Jacob blessing his sons, and he uniquely tells Judah, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Or we think of Balaam's enigmatic prophecy from the book of Numbers. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. One from Jacob shall exercise dominion. All of these prophecies are being gathered up, they're being pulled forward to this king. All peoples will fall under this king's scepter. But you also notice in verse 17 that the nations praise him forever and ever. These, these ladies of honor are likely the daughters of conquered kings, yet with joy and gladness, it says. They come into the palace of the king. So how are we going to put this together? How can a conquered people rejoice? One 19th century scholar, W.S. Plummer, said this, there are two ways in which the wicked fall before Christ. One is to ask and receive mercy. The other is to sink under the weight of his wrath. Everyone has to come to terms with Jesus. Does your heart break for those who still live in rebellion against him? Those who bow to his lordship receive his mercy. He is meek and lowly of heart and humble, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He is a good king who forgives and conquers our sin. He makes us holy. He welcomes us into his presence. But those who stubbornly align themselves with wickedness, those who oppose his righteous rule, those who remain the enemies of his people, he will return to judge. As Paul says, God will grant relief to you who are afflicted. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The cry for vindication from the deceitful and unjust man of Psalm 43 is answered in this king. Do you know this king? Do you long for this king? Do you long for his righteous rule? 
You know, in, in our political climate, it's so tempting to make a mere man our Savior. I don't know who said this. It was either John Stott or Charles Spurgeon, but it goes something like this. In the end, we don't want a democratic republic. We want to see him seated, his imperial majesty seated on the throne, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we want in the end. Well, now it's, it's staring us in the face. This king is no mere man. The psalmist has been addressing a human king who bears a sword and a scepter, and he rides a horse, and he wears a royal robe. But then all of a sudden, in verse 6, he addresses God himself. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Is the king God himself? God in the flesh? Well, we know that Israel's kings were never considered deities like Egypt thought of their pharaohs. Israel's kings were not worshipped. That would be high-handed idolatry. Yet there's this building mystery in the Old Testament. We read of a Messiah who worships God, yet appears to be God as well, that they are so closely aligned. We hear the king's throne is referred to as God's throne. But then in verse 7, the psalmist says, Therefore God, your God, has anointed you. Are they one and the same or not? Well, this is only resolved in the coming of Jesus Christ. Think of the ministry of John the Baptist. He was sent to prepare the way of the Lord. He says, after me comes he who was mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. So the one John is referring to is the Lord. And he wears sandals. He's fully God, fully man. Do I think the psalmist fully understood this? I I don't think he did. But it it would also be a mistake to think that what he's written was not fulfilled in Christ. We look back, we look at this through New Testament eyes. The author of Hebrews makes this crystal clear. He pulls no punches. Uh, He quotes verses 6 through 7 in their entirety to prove that Jesus is the very Son of God, superior to angels, and the one through whom the world was created. He writes, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. That's, that's pretty clear. So I remember running into some Jehovah's Witnesses one day in Croatia. Uh, Daniel and I were missionaries there. I wasn't just hanging out in some Eastern European country, but there I was one day in our pedestrian town, lots of people milling about, and Jehovah's Witnesses came up to me began to draw me into a conversation, give me some of their literature. Uh, I have to confess, I, I, I didn't understand everything they were telling me. Uh, Danielle's Croatian has always been better than mine, but, but I did manage to get this one sentence out. I said, Jesus Christ je Bog, which is, Jesus Christ is God. And I'm telling you, they went berserk. No, 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 no. There was three or four ladies, just no, 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 no. They, 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 they couldn't stand that thought. And I, I literally turned, and I raised my hand, and I said, I yelled, Jesus Christ, ye bog. I don't know what the people thought around me, but <laughs> I, I didn't know what else. To, I thought, this, this is the best thing I can tell these people. <clears throat> this king, anointed by God, literally messiahed by God, is the divine Lord on the throne. And he has a bride. I have three quick points here. First, her holiness. She stands at his right hand, and her beauty and glory is a reflection of his own. Just look at her clothing. Verse 14, all glorious is the princess in her chamber, with robes interwoven with gold, and many colored robes she has led to the king. So the scene is a beautiful picture of the church. The bride's brilliant clothing points to our holiness, our cleansing before the Lord. We we, we reflect his glory. You remember Paul writes, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. 
This is what Christ has done for us. He has cleansed us from our sin. And though they were like scarlet, he has made them white as snow. Our garments are clean. The shame has been removed. He doesn't hold our sins over our heads. He has tread them underfoot. And he's cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. The bride is holy. Second, her identity and calling. Apparently, the bride of Psalm 45 is from another nation. She and her companions are daughters of kings, probably the daughters of conquered enemies from verse 5. She is quite likely a Gentile. You think a faithful Israelite was not supposed to marry a foreigner, right? Because of the danger of being corrupted by the idolatry of the nations. But there's no such danger for this king. No, his righteousness is such that his bride is won over. She leaves her father's ways and follows the true God of the king. The psalmist tells her, in place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. Again, it's a beautiful picture of the church. The bride of Christ, a people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation who have forsaken their sin and are now called to make disciples of all nations. The royal family just grows and grows. Third, her devotion. So before the wedding, the psalmist has some instructions for this princess. Uh, Verses 10 and 11, Hear, O daughter, and consider, and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. So the psalmist wants her to know what kind of devotion she should have for the king. He's he's emphatic. He says, hear, consider, incline your ear. Those words, they just stack up one upon the other. He says, forget your people and your father's house. That that might sound severe, but, but isn't this the same instruction for men who marry? Right? You go back to Genesis It says, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. So the primary relationship in this man's life is no longer mom and dad. It's his wife. A son has to leave his parents and be devoted to becoming a husband. Same thing here. When this daughter is married, she is now primarily focused on becoming a wife. A new family has been forged. Former bonds and allegiances have to change. It's, it's actually a good picture of becoming a Christian. It, it's repentance and faith. The old way of living is over. You, you have to turn from that. You have a new identity now, a new name, a new family in Jesus Christ. Your husband desires your beauty. You can't give it to someone else anymore. And I'll just say, men, if that language makes you squirm, you're fine. This is a metaphor. The church is the bride of Christ. We are called to be devoted to him, to be faithful to him, which means former ways of thinking about yourself and your life are upended. Everything changes. I remember hearing the theologian J.I. Packer uh, in his old age. He was being interviewed, and uh, he was asked, "What, what would you tell a new believer first? Well, what do they need to hear first? What, What counsel would you have for them? He said, You have a new master now. The psalmist says, since he is your Lord, bow to him. You see see an indicative and an imperative. An indicative statement of fact, he is your Lord. The command flowing out of that, bow to him. How does the authority of Christ operate in your life? In what area of your life do you still resist his lordship. Where do you start to bow and then flinch? I think I might want to go my way this time. The princess does not begrudge this union. She is not unsettled. She is led to the king with joy and gladness, acknowledging his authority, standing at his right hand. It's all gain. There's no loss. She finds her worth and the love of of her king. Her beauty, her glory is a reflection 
of his. She reflects her king. His joy is her joy. What he loves, she loves. Her very life is bound up with his. Is this how you tend to think about your relationship with Christ? You know, our culture is pressuring us in the exact opposite direction. You look again at that last line from Psalm 44. He cries out to God, redeem us. But our culture says, redeem yourself. Create yourself. Look deep within and find out who you really are and then present yourself to the world and demand their praise. It is an evil lie. It promises life, but it leads to death. It's actually suffocating. It's a crushing pressure on people to fashion their own identity. We weren't made for this. It has produced skyrocketing anxiety and addictions and the fear of missing out and an overconcern with body image and on and on. It is an ugly inversion upon the self when we were created to live for the glory of the king. One pastor wrote, you exist to make someone else look good. It's not limiting, it's liberating. And don't be surprised if it makes you happy. So friends, become well acquainted with the glory of Jesus Christ. Revel in this king. Did you know that Jesus wants you to see his glory? That's what he prays for us. Listen, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. Ask him for it. Show me your glory. Even right now, as we take a few moments to reflect on these things, and then I'll pray for us. Oh Lord, we humbly bow before you our rightful king. We long, Lord, for the consummation of your kingdom at your return, and all will be well. Thank you for drawing us, your church, unto yourself. Show us your glory, and help us to live for your glory.